Isaiah chapter 10. Isaiah chapter 10. And for the conservation of time, I'm going to read verse 20 and uh, through 23. We'll read 20 through 23. I'm going to try to give some exposition to the whole, whole chapter, whole text, um, if we can. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see what the Holy Spirit and how the Lord shares. Amen. All right, let's look there, verse 20. Isaiah chapter 10, verse 20. If you're there, say amen. amen. And the Bible says, New King James Translation, and it shall come to pass in that day that the remnant of Israel, such as have escaped of the house of Jacob, will never again depend on him who defeated them but will depend on the Lord, the Holy One of Israel in truth. The remnant will return. The remnant of Jacob, they're going to return to the mighty God. For though your people, O Israel, be as the sand of the sea, a remnant of them will return. The destruction decreed shall overflow with righteousness. For the Lord God of hosts will make a determined end in the midst of all the land. Amen. We've read verses 20 through 23 from the book of the prophet Isaiah. If you bear with me, I'll give some explanation to this prophetic word. I want to talk about turning obstacles into opportunities. Take somebody by the hand, look them in the eye, and just, or just look at your name and tell them, neighbor, neighbor. Turning, turning obstacles into opportunity. Now tell somebody on the other side, and tell neighbor, neighbor. God specializes in turning obstacles into opportunity. Shout at somebody across the room around the region. Shout, neighbor. neighbor. Oh, good neighbor. Oh, neighbor. God, God can turn your obstacles into opportunities. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Amen. God can turn life's obstacles into opportunities. I wish I could tell the folk down in Texas and down in Florida and down in the Caribbean. I know it looks dark. I know it looks dismal. I know it looks bleak. I know some of you still don't have any lights and no water, nowhere to go, but I need to tell somebody today, no matter how dark and dismal it looks, God is able to turn obstacles into divine opportunities. Are y'all with me today? We've been preaching from the book of the prophet Isaiah for the past couple of months and reading through Isaiah. And when you read the book of Isaiah, amen, you have to understand that the whole book, every chapter, every prophecy, every message is not written in chronological order. It is not written as if someone was sitting down recording like you do a regular book or a regular article, but, but, but there are some pieces that are borrowed from, from other books, other chapters, but prophecy, there are some songs. There are some praises. There are some, uh, there are some woes in this book. But, but, but we understand it, even though it's not written in chronological order, it is written in divine order. It's not divine order. God has orchestrated the work. Amen? And, and because God has a plan, God has an order, God always allow his order to come forth. It, it may not make sense to our logical, analytical mind because we try to figure things out, but we have to understand God's ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. He don't operate like us. Sometimes we're trying to see the end from the beginning, but God sees the God, God already knows the end from the beginning. Are y'all going to help me today? See, we're trying to peep from the front and trying to see the end result. God says, I already know the end result before you begin. I, I know. Therefore, I, that's why he said in Isaiah 55, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. I don't think like you. Tell your neighbor, he don't think like you. We have to think like God. What do you mean think like God? We have to think like God. We have to get God's Word in our heart, in our mind, in our spirit, and begin to say, what is God saying? How is God operating? What is God doing? Not what I think, the way I feel, not the way I see it, because you may not, you may have blurred vision. You may be blind. But God says, 
God says, whatever, whatever his word, whatever his will is, God will bring it to pass. Are y'all listening today? And let me just say a word about understanding biblical prophecy, because sometimes when you read a uh, prophecy, particularly Old Testament, it may not always make sense. A lot of times, say, well, you know, people may ask, well, why are we reading that Old Testament book? It just don't make sense. That, that portion that he just read just don't make sense to me. Hold on, hold on. You see, biblical prophecy is God's purpose through prophecy. Prophecy is a decoration of the mind, the will, and the purpose of God that is communicated through his servants, the prophets. What did I just say? Prophecy is what? Is the decoration of the mind, the will, and the purpose of God that is communicated through his prophets or his servants, his who communicate God's will. God speaks through prophecy. God speaks through his spiritual decoration. He speaks revelation. He he also speaks through dreams. He speaks through he speaks through vision. He speaks through the spirit. God's prophetic messages may not always seem logical uh, at the moment, especially over. Old Testament prophecy, but we have to understand that prophecy is, is situation specific. Say situation specific. They're spoken or declared, they're written to a specific people at a specific place in time with a divine purpose. They are both personal and corporate. God will speak a word personal to you, but he'll also speak a word corporately to your family or to a corporate house or a, a city or a region, a state or a nation. Whenever God sends a word, God will, he may send a word on the East Coast for the West Coast, but that word is for everybody. Are y'all with me here? We have to understand God speaks in his own way. God, God, God don't always make sense to us. God, God, but we have to understand God either speak personally or God speak corporately. God, God speak multi-generationally. God speak multifaceted. God, God, God can speak a word now. That word may not come to pass until one year, two years, 10, 20, 30. It may be 400 years. You remember when the children of Israel were, were in Egypt and, and Jacob told them, take my bones out of Egypt now? They didn't understand take your bones out of Egypt. He was talking 400 years later. They stayed in Egypt 400 years, but because God has spoken the prophecy, the prophecy did come to pass. It may not, it may not come now, but if God said it, he's going to do it. Just tell your neighbor, wake him up and tell him if God said it, he's going to do it. Th that's why the book of Habakkuk said, write the vision. Make it plain. Write it that those that run, that read it, can, they can see it. And you have to understand, when God gives a vision even for your own life, you know, you can't tell it to everybody because everybody ain't with you. Everybody don't see what you see. Everybody ain't going to understand what God is doing in your life, especially you're going to have some haters, you're going to have some alligators. Come on, talk to me, somebody. Amen. But you got to understand, everybody is not always in your favor, but, but you have to know if God has spoken it to you, God will, God will take a whole different route to take you where you need to be. I'm, I'm sure when, when God told Abraham to leave home and leave your family, leave your home and, and, and go to a place I'm going to send you, I'm sure the folks are saying, boy, you crazy. But God said it. God will do it. Are y'all with me? God's word, God's word may be spoken prophetically, but God will make his word applicable to every generation. Although, although spoken in the past, God will make it happen in the present and in the future. That's why when you read the Bible, eschatology, the term eschatology, which is end time prophecy, that's why you book, read the book of Revelation. A lot of folks scared to read the book of Revelation because they don't understand the book of Revelation, but the book of Revelation is an end time prophecy. Even the book of Isaiah, when Isaiah spoke the word of God, he was speaking to a future time. He told, he told them that it would come to pass. That's why when you go back and read the book in chapter 7, chapter 7, uh, God gives a prophecy uh, through his prophet Isaiah. Isaiah spoke to multiple generations. He really spoke to four generations because if you go back and read chapter 1, he said the book, the book of the prophet Isaiah, which he saw during the time of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz and Hezekiah. This is for administration. But everything God spoke to him didn't happen at that in every, uh, in every uh, season, but a lot of that was fulfilled later. He talked of the coming of the Messiah. In chapter 7, he talked about the Emmanuel, that Emmanuel would come. Well, Emmanuel, Jesus didn't come until the New Testament. 
Are y'all with me here? Just hold on. Just walk with me. Chapter 8, he talks about the prophecy of the coming invasion of, of, of the Assyrians. He let them know that uh, the Israel, because they had disobeyed God in their sin of abandonment, they had gotten away from God. God said, I'm going to send forth the Assyrians. God let them know that the Syrians would be barbaric. They would be, a, 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 they would be wicked. They would be a people that, that would come swiftly like a raging flood, like a strong, uh, fierce wind, like, that, like, like an army without mercy. God would allow them to come like a fierce hurricane, like Hurricane Harvey and Hurricane Irma in his sovereignty. Listen. In his sovereignty, God sometimes permissively allows things to happen that may not make sense in the natural order, but God has a greater purpose. Are y'all with me here? He'll send a hurricane, Hugo, and a Andrew, and a Katrina, and a Rita, and drunk Harvey, drunk Harvey. Harvey and Irma act like two drunk people out of control, high on alcohol, crack, and everything else, just driving like a drunk man. Har Harvey was driving through like a drunk man, and then Irma came through like a mad woman looking for child support. Where at? Where at? <laughs> Is he in Cuba? Is he in the Bahamas? <laughs> Is he in Florida? Is he in the Keys, Miami? Where, where, where you at? That's why we didn't know which way that storm was coming. But God evacuated everybody, whether you had a yacht or whether you had a yet. You had to get out. And no matter who was in the White House or the State House, they couldn't legislate that storm. Are oh, y'all listening to me? You, they could have they could have voted a, a hundred to, to zero, but it still wouldn't have legislated that storm. God sometimes sovereignly, providentially allows some things that don't make sense. 16 years ago, 9-11, yes, lives were lost, but God sometimes allows losses so that we can celebrate victories. It brought our nation back to her knees so that we can think about prayer. Three areas that were hit. Y'all just walk with me this morning. It, it, it impacted money, world trade, military, with all the military might and intelligence we have. How in the world can somebody hijack three planes? Talk to me. It impacted the minds because while we thought we were a boastful, proud nation that nobody could touch us, it impacted the mind because everybody was walking around in fear. Terrorists, their whole goal, their motive is to create an atmosphere of fear. Make you free, afraid, scared, terror. That's what it is, fear. Everybody's scared. Can't go to the airport. Got to almost streak just to get, in, get, get on the airplane. Take your belt off, shoes off, and, but, but that's security. Are y'all with me? God will use catastrophic events to bring people together. Black, white, whether you're Hispanic, whether you're from the border, south of the border, on the other side of the border, or whether you don't know which way is up. Everybody was in the dark. Everybody didn't have water. They didn't have electricity. They were impacted by the storm on the cruise ships or those who didn't have no ship at all. Can't get no help in here. Theologically, when things like that happen, we got to ask the question, what is God saying? Maybe God is trying to tell us something. M maybe we've been focusing on so many other things. God says, I can, I can let you build 
an empire, take years to build it, I can permissively allow one storm and take it all away. When Katrina hit, we went down to Mississippi and down in that area. There were some multi-million dollar homes right on the ocean that the foundations were left. But what had happened was the storm, the surge of the water, the ocean came up, grabbed the house and all its contents and took it back and slung it in the ocean and left nothing but a foundation. Somebody said, that's mean. That's, that's an evil God. I don't want to serve a God like that, but sometimes God will let you know that your faith is not in your stuff. I don't care how many oil fields you got out there. God said that oil is mine because the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. Sometimes God will allow us to stop looking at our stuff and get our focus off a of thing and turn our eyes toward him and declare, I will lift up my eyes to the hills from whence cometh my help. My help comes from the Lord that made the heaven and the earth. Some of y'all remember when Homolite shut down. Come on, talk to me, somebody. Y'all sitting up here like Alice in Wonderland. All these companies, you could leave one job and quit a job today and go find another job same day. All of these jobs, everybody, you thought you had job security, but the folk let you know your security is not in your job. Your security is in your God. And if you make your little job your God, then God says you are abandoning the real God. Then who's going to pay your bills? Telephone disconnect. Waiting on the next paycheck. How you going to pay your rent? All your money spent. Tell you what you ought to do. Jesus will see you through. Somebody know you are the product of parents who had to learn how to survive on nothing. How to turn obstacles of the past, how to turn pain into praise. See, the reason you can praise God is because you've had some pressure, you've had some pain. I can't get no help in here. God knows how to. Who's driving your bus? Ask somebody who's driving your bus. Hallelujah. As we look at the text, God here in this text, and thank you for walking with me, he allowed God use the Assyrians as a chastising um, instrument in the lives of his people in order to bring them back into focus. And God let them know that in order for him to turn obstacles and opportunity, there's some things you got to understand. The first of all, don't forget your dependency on God. Somebody write that down. Don't forget your dependency on God. Let's go to verse 1, chapter 10. Let's go to verse 1, chapter 10. Let's look at the Word. Look at the Word. Look at the Word. Look at the Word. The Word of God says, Woe to those who decree unrighteousness. Okay? This really is a carryover from chapter, chapter 9, but, but just for the sake of, of conservation of time, let's keep reading. He said, who write misfortune which they have prescribed to rob the needy of justice, to make what is right from the, take what is right from the poor of my people, that widows may be their prey, and they may rob the fatherless. What I would do in the day of punishment and in the desolation which I will come from afar, to whom will you flee for help? And where will you leave your glory? Verse number four, look there. Verse number four, the Word of God says what? Without me, they shall bow down among the prisoners. They shall fall among the slain, for all his anger is not turned away, but his hand is still stretched out. God says without me, without him, somebody shout without God, who is our help, our hope. Without God, we are hopeless. We are helpless. 
the problem with Israel was abandonment. They had neglected God. They had lost focus. They had lost faith. They had lost fellowship. And, and, and as they became uh, progressive, as they become prosperous uh, in their advancement in the land, they neglected their allegiance to God. God permissively allowed the Syrians to come in and invade the land. In verse 4, he says, it, 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 it's, it's a constant reminder, for he says, without me. They shall bow. Without God, without God, we, we can do nothing. Without God, we fall, we fail, we, we falter. Without God, we live defeated life. Without God, we are hopeless and helpless. Tell your neighbor, we need God. Israel had become discouraged. They had become defeated. They had become depleted. They were distraught. They were disillusioned. They were dismayed. They were going through a whole lot. They were depressed. They were down. They were drowning. They were overwhelmed. They were overtaken. Many people in our time today, people are living depressed. They are living discouraged. They are living defeated. They are living in chaos because they have lost connection with their creator. Are y'all with me? They're like Mike Tyson. They're trying to fill empty holes. Got money, but you're trying to fill empty holes. A lot of folks are trying to fill empty, empty holes. Mike Tyson said, I made a whole lot of money, but I was doing a lot of crazy stuff. The problem was, and he said, I look back on it, the reason I was doing what I was doing was I was trying to fill some empty holes. Empty holes. I was empty. I wish I knew where the money went. I wish I knew what happened. I wish I knew what happened to my life. He says, as I look back now, I was simply trying to fill empty holes. There are a whole lot of folks who live today, they're trying to fill empty holes. It's empty holes. Trying to find things. Trying to go here and there, still empty. Come to church, you're still empty. The only one that can fill the void in your life is God. You need God. Amen, somebody. That's why Jesus said, come unto me, all that labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Uh, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. You know, when you lose focus and lose fellowship and you don't have faith in God, you've lost connection with your Creator, you're going to live empty. You can chase dreams, but they'll become empty dreams. Dreams can become nightmares if God is not in the equation. Preach, Dr. Hinton. You got to have God. Let's look down your row and tell them you got to have God at the head of the equation. See, a lot of times we want God in the equation. No, God has to be at the head of the, we, you know, just, we'll, we'll tack God in at the back somewhere just, just as long as we say, well, I'm a believer. You know, I trust God. I believe God. Well, the Bible says demons believe God. You can't have God at the back end. You got to have God at the head. You, you got to declare like Joshua, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. You, Jesus said you got to seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all the stuff, all these things will be had it. You don't tack God on to your stuff. You tack stuff on to God. And you declare everything I got, it already belongs to him. It's not mine. I'm dependent on God. We're dependent on God. We breathe God's air. We live in God's world. The earth is the Lord and the fullness there are. You don't own nothing. You may pay rent on your house. You don't pay rent on air. Did you, pay your, did you pay your air bill today? Every time you inhale and exhale, how much did you pay for that? We ain't got no light. Some of y'all come to church. It's too hot, it's too cold, and some of y'all ain't paying nothing. Everything we have, it belongs to God. Preach, Dr. Hinton. First of all, I said, don't forget your what? Dependency on God. Secondly, don't focus on your adversary. Remember your advocate. That's what God told Israel. That, listen, look at verse number five. Look, look at verse number five. God used the Syrians uh, to chastise them. The Bible says, woe. He opens by saying, woe to the Assyria. He says, the rod of my anger and the staff whose hand is my indignation. He said, I will send him against an ungodly nation, against the people of my wrath. I will give them charge. 
to seize the spoil, to take the prey, to tread down, uh, tread them down like uh, the mire of the street, yet he does not mean so, nor does his heart think so. He said, but it is in his heart to destroy and cut off not a few nations. In other words, the Assyrians got boastful. They thought that because God had sent them, they didn't realize that God was using them. They got proud. They got arrogant. They start thinking, well, you know, we're going to do this ourselves. So look at, look at what, look at what, look at what they said. I'm going to skip through some things. And then again, go back and read it. He said, therefore, it shall, verse 12, it shall come to pass when the Lord has performed all his works on the Mount of Zion and Jerusalem that he will what? Say, I will punish the fruit of the arrogant heart of the king of Assyria and the glory of his haughty look. For he said, look at verse 13, he said, by the strength of my hand I've done it. By my wisdom I, I, I am prudent. I have removed the boundaries of the people. I have robbed their treasure. So, so I put down the inhabitants like, uh, like a valiant man. My hand has found like a nest in the riches of the people. And as the one gathers egg that are left, I have gathered all the earth. And there was no one who moved his wing nor opened his mouth even with the people. So uh, Assyrians had become arrogant by saying, I've done this. If you read Isaiah chapter 14, you also see a replica. Amen. Keep reading, you find the fall of Lucifer, the fall of Satan. Satan started talking about, I will be lifted up. I, I. See, pride always goes before the fall. Y'all with me? Look, in fact, put your finger there. Let's go over there. I can show you better than I can tell you. Look over at, let, look over at uh, uh, Isaiah chapter 14. Chapter 14. He's talking about the fall of ba Babylon and the fall of Lucifer. Okay? Verse 12. Go there. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12. So we have the guard against becoming so too, too puffed up, even in ourselves. God wants to keep our feet on the floor and our knees on the ground. Amen. Praise God. Stay humble. Tell your neighbor, stay humble. Yeah. Amen. Look at what he says. He says, how are you fallen from heaven who? O Lucifer, son of the morning. How are you cut down to the ground? You who weaken the nation. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farther side of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be, notice what the devil, looked, Lucifer said, I will be like the most high. I. I. But verse 15, God says, you got to fall. You're going to be brought down to shoal to the lowest depths of the pit. And those who see you will gaze at you and consider you, saying, is this the man who made the earth tremble, who shook the kingdom, who made the world as a wilderness and destroyed its cities, who did not open the house of his prisoners? All the kings of the nations, all of them sleep in glory. Everyone is own house. We have to understand that pride will bring you down. Yes, it will. So we have to learn not to focus on our adversary. Focus on your advocate. Let's, let's see the difference. Adversary is one who opposes. In the text, it's the Assyrians. Advocate is one who supports or defends a cause one who pleads on behalf of another. As faith believers, we all understand God is our advocate. Come on, tell somebody God is our advocate. In fact, John, 1 John chapter 1, chapter 2, verse 1 and 2 talks about the Father, and we are an advocate with the Father, who is Jesus the Christ. In this text, we understand God says, don't focus on the Assyrian, don't, don't focus on the Assyrian army who boasts in what they have done to my people, but he says, focus on your advocate. We got an advocate with God. So no matter what you're going through, the Word of God says, in spite of what you're going through, in spite of what it looks like, know that God can turn obstacles into opportunities. The Syrians had become so boastful and arrogant that, that God had to let them know, look, hold up, wait a minute. 
I just use you. But God has the last word. And sometimes when you go through things in life, you got to learn to stop uh, asking, why am I going through it? But God, what are you trying to teach me? We got to ask God in all this stuff that's going on in the world, what is God trying to tell us? What, what is God trying to tell America? Well, what is he trying to tell us? That the power is in the president? That Congress and governmental affairs, they run the world? That the governor can legislate that, that the local power is in charge? What is God trying to tell us? He's in control. That means our faith, our trust, our confidence not, should not be based even on Social Security. But trust in God. I need you to tell three people and tell them to trust in God. <laughs> not your job. Because there ain't no security in that job. There's no security. I don't care what they promise. There's no security. in. Put your, it's better to put your confidence in God, your trust in God, than to put confidence in man. We have, to, we have to know God is, God is your advocate. Are you with me? He's with you. Thirdly, 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 y'all with me? Let's finish this. First of all, I said, don't put your, don't forget your what? Dependency on God. That's right. Then I said, don't what? Advocate. God, who's your advocate? Who's with you? Who's for you? Who's standing beside you? Who giving you free air? Who's giving you health and strength? Where does your help come from? Who owns the world? Who's in charge? Who the man? <laughs> He's the man. Thirdly, you got to trust God's prophetic promise. Somebody shout, trust God's prophetic promise. Let's look at the Word. Let's look at the Word. I'm almost through. Look at the Word. We're going to close this out. Look at the Word. Let's look at verse 20. Let's look at verse 20. Are you there? The Bible says what? And it shall come to pass. When God says it shall come to pass, he means it's going to happen. He's going to do it. Not in your time, not on p.m., not on a.m., but in God's timing. God's manifested time. We told you that it shall come to pass. Notice God said, in that day, that the remnant, those who remain, those who are surviving, he said, the remnant of Israel, such as have escaped of the house of Jacob, he said, will never again depend on him, notice, who defeated him. See that? They're not going to focus on the Assyrians, those who struck them. He said, but will depend faithfully, trust in the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. Put your trust in God. 21 says the remnant will return, the remnant of Jacob. They're going to return. Where are they returning to? They're going to return to the mighty God. That's what God is trying to bring back, bring us back to focus. God is trying to bring nation. God is trying to teach succeeding generations that, yeah, you got gadgets, you got gizmos, you got things, you got, you're living better, you're dressing better, you're driving better, got more money than you ever had a century ago. But God is trying to bring people back to an awareness and acknowledgement that we still need God. You don't teach your children that you would have some godless children. And then they got to grow up and they won't, their light bulb won't come on until they really hit a wall and then they have no God. They have no strength. They have not known God. They've gone to church or they decided, hey, I'm not going to church because mama made me go to church. But if we don't get some God in our babies and our children, we will become a nation like Israel just during the period of judges. There, there's a nation that did not know God. Everybody's doing what is right in their own eyes. Why do you think God told Solomon? Why do you think God spoke through Solomon? Solomon said God, Solomon had built the temple and built the house of God and had worshiped God and said, listen, if I allow the pestilence, if I hold back the rain, 
if I allow things to happen, if my people, which are called by my name, would humble themselves and pray and seek my faith and turn from their wicked ways, then I'll forgive the sin. I'll heal the land. He'll heal. God wants to bring healing. God wants to bring spiritual healing. God, God wants to give you some stuff. Tell your neighbor, God wants to give you some stuff. stuff. Stuff is not a problem. He wants you to have success. But what good is success if you don't have no spiritual connection with God? Jesus asked the question one day, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his own soul? You got stuff, but you ain't got no peace of mind. Got the best bed that money can buy, but you can't sleep. You got security all around. You got, you got bodyguards. You got burglar alarm. You got bar, uh, burglar bar. You got all of that, but you can't sleep. You feel, still feel insecure. It's your party. Everybody's at your party. Everybody else singing and drinking and all that, but you still feel like you're in a box alone. You got people around you, and you're still lonely. You'd be surprised. People sit in church or they go to work. They are alone. Not about having people around you, but it's about having a relationship with God where your soul connects with your creator. When you can know that if whether I got people around me or whether I'm all by myself, I got God. Tell somebody, I got God. <laughs> I've got God. I'll tell somebody, I've got God on my side. Hallelujah. Look, look at what he says in verse 24. He said, for the Lord God of hosts will do what? Will make a determined end. God got the last word. We'll make a determined end in the midst of all the land. Aren't you glad God know your plan, go know your future? Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad? The Amplified Bible says the Lord, the Lord of hosts will make a full end where there, whatever is determined or decreed in the midst of the earth. Whatever God has spoken about you, that's what God's going to do. Amen. Whatever God has said. Whatever God has for you, you know, we sing this song, what God has for me, it is for me. Well, why are you tripping? <laughs> what God has for me, it is for me. You ought to get excited. You ought to get excited. You ought to shout, I'm blessed. I'm excited in God. Whatever God has prepared for me, Whatever God has planned for me, whatever God has ordained for me, Jeremiah 29, 11 crowd, uh, Sumner, whatever God has for you, whatever God said, he th his thoughts, his plan, his agenda for you, you ought to get excited. Thank, thank you, Sister Doris, even though you went through divorce and debt and separate, all that stuff, God can turn things around. I wish you'd tell somebody God can turn it around for you. He can turn. You may have some sickness in your body. You ought to believe God for healing. Amen. Amen. You, ought to believe, you ought to believe God for your deliverance. Tell somebody, I'm believing God. I'm believing God. He may not do it on my time. He may not do it like I want, but I'm believing God. I, I wish I had some folks in here that keep speaking it in the atmosphere. You got to speak God's word in the atmosphere. You may have a need. You may have some lack in your life. You got to begin to declare God's word. Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Amen. Let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God that surpasses all understanding shall keep your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. You got to keep speaking the word of God. My God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. You got to keep speaking. What shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Who did not spare his own son, but God gave his own son up that we might have life and victory. Whatever it is, God is able 
able to turn it around. Don't you remember one Friday evening, it looked dark, it looked dismal, it looked like it was a hopeless situation, but somebody said from the sixth to the ninth hour, he hung there suspended between heaven and earth. It looked like it was all over, but how many know God has the last word? Because when God has the last word, yeah, heaven will rejoice at your failure, but God will celebrate and say, listen, what your enemy meant for your evil, God shift it for your good. You got to stand. Yeah, they fired you on the job. Yeah, they gave you a pink slip. Yeah, they said you wouldn't make it. Yeah, they said you wouldn't amount to anything, but you ought to shout what God said. I know the thoughts. I know the plans. I know I got the last word. And even when you're hanging on the cross, when Jesus was on the cross, it looked dark, it looked dismal, yet they put him in the grave. It looked like it was over on Friday, but how many know early Sunday morning? Early Sunday morning, we are here today because early Sunday morning, God turned it around. God turned it around. God shifted. God shifted. Will you tell some, somebody God is turning things around in your life? He's shifting some things. He's shifting some things. He's shifting some things. Sometimes you go through a moment of chaos. It looked like it's chaos, but it ain't chaos. God said, I'm shifting some stuff. I'm rearranging your life. I'm repositioning you. I'm elevating you. I'm expanding you. I'm promoting you. I'm getting ready for something greater. Will you tell somebody I'm getting ready? I'm getting ready. Tell your neighbor I'm getting ready for something greater. Greater, greater, greater. Greater, greater, greater. Greater, greater, greater. Put it in the atmosphere. Come on, put it in the atmosphere. Greater is coming. 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 Healing is coming. Deliverance is coming. Breakthrough is coming. Your promise is coming. Your scholarship is coming. Your hollership is coming. Yes, 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 yes. You may not see it in the natural, but learn to put a praise on it. Put a praise on it. God, I thank you. God, I thank you. I thank you. I thank you. I thank you. You said it. You said it. I believe it. It's settled. Say yeah. Say yeah. Say yeah. I want you to encourage three people and tell them greater, greater, greater. Come on, tell them greater is coming. Come on, let's get it in the atmosphere. Greater. Greater is coming. Greater is coming. Greater is coming. Greater, greater, greater. Get it on your greater. Greater, greater, greater. And let me just talk to some senior citizens. <laughs> your ladder. <laughs> you got to speak it in the atom. Your ladder shall <laughs> be greater. Come on, I need somebody else to shout across the room. Greater, 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 greater is coming. Greater is coming for you. Hallelujah. Greater is coming for you. Uh, hallelujah. Sister Doris shared her heart this morning. It's just a brief testimony. And I didn't know that. Didn't know that. Where are you, Doris? Where does she go? She's in the back. 
we see people and they look good. They look wonderful. We are polished. We are professional. We got it all together. But sometimes people see the glow. They don't know your story. They don't know your struggle. They don't know your storm. They don't know you done survived Katrina, Rita, Hugo, and all them other goals. <laughs> but God, I need some witnesses in the house. Thank, thank you, huh? Thank you. I thought somebody, you, there's some survivors, there's some hurricane survivors in the house. You, you didn't have, you, didn't, you may not have gone through a physical hurricane, but you went through some other hurricane. And you're still here. And you're still here. You're still here. Why you're so quiet? You're still here. You don't gotta pray. You're still here. Still here. Still here. They, they, folk, they don't know what you've been through. They don't know your story. They don't know. They don't know. They don't know. They don't know. Folk don't know. That's why every now and then we gotta tell. We gotta tell our story. It's all right to tell your children. I learned about prayer through my father. Learned about perseverance through his, through his perseverance. Just hearing his story. Somebody here today need God to turn some stuff around for you. Run to this altar right quick. We're going have, to have the invitation of discipleship, but you need God to turn some stuff around for you. Come on, come quickly, come quickly. You need, God, you need a turnaround. You need some stuff turned. You need God to shift some stuff in your life. I ain't, I ain't trying to ask you to get up and testify. Y'all moving too slow. You need God to turn some stuff around in your life. I need you to come to this altar. Come, 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 come. Nobody has to know but you. Maybe you're dealing with some silent frustration, some pain, some anger, some issues. I got shoes, you got shoes, all of us got issues. <laughs> but I need God, I need God, I need God to shift. I need God to turn it, I need God to turn it. And, and, and don't be selfish, you may know somebody else that you know, you know God need to turn some stuff around for them. You need a breakthrough, you need a door open. You need a way made. You need a bridge. Sometimes you just need a Red Sea open. It's more than just one. It, I need God to open that Red Sea. I need God to do some things for me. I need God to do some supernatural things. I need, I need a, somebody need a miracle right now. You need a miracle, a miracle door, a job, a healing, whatever you need God to do in your life. Tell God, do it. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Sometimes God needs to break some hearts. He needs to touch your heart. Because sometimes things on your heart will weigh you down. It'll block your vision and blur your heart from receiving what God has for you. It'll shut you down. It'll have you having a spiritual heart blockage, and you won't know what's happening. You're on the verge of a stroke. Lift those hands. You got to acknowledge, first of all, your dependency on God. See, by lifting your hands to God, you're saying, God, I need you. I need my dependency on God is non-negotiable. I can't make it without you, God. I want you to talk to him right now. As you pray, tell him what's on your heart. I saw LaJuan Chisholm in the house, and I praise God for her this morning, pressing her way in the midst of her storm. But I believe God. I believe God. Talk to the Lord this morning. You talk to him. Why are you at the altar? Lift up those family concerns. Lift up those financial burdens. Lift up those issues. Lift up those things. Lift up that career choice. Lift up that, 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 that marriage choice. Lift up that that financial decision. Lift up that house purchase, that car purchase, that school, that whatever it is, that job promotion. You may be up for it, but is it up for you? Pray right now. 
Pray right now. Pray right now. You said, I don't know what to pray. Just say, Lord, have mercy. God, I need you right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come in your presence now. We thank you for your word. Thank you for the prophecy of your word. Thank you for the exposition of your word. We pray, God, that your people have received the prophetic instruction as you've given it to me. God, I've deposited it in this house. I yield myself right now as your vessel and instrument. I pray that the words of our mouth and meditation of our heart is acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and redeemer. Now, God, I pray for everyone at this altar. Your people have come with burdens. They've come with concerns. They've come with needs. They've come with issues. They've come with weight. They've come with worry. They've come with things weighing them down that, that only you know, God. And so, God, we, we ask you in the name of Jesus. We ask you to speak healing right now. Speak deliverance right now. We need you to turn the bus around. We need you to turn the plane around. We, we need you to stop the train right now. We need you to stop that hurricane. Stop that storm right now. Somebody's come with tears in their eyes and, and, and wounds in their heart. You only, God, can heal. We pray for your healing right now. In the name of Jesus, whatever the need, Whatever the need, God, you're able to supply all our needs. And we say thank you. Forgive us for all of our sins. Blot out every transgression from doubt to disobedience. Whatever it is, we confess it now. And we thank you that the Lord Jesus is our advocate. He's our advocate, our intercessor, our Savior, and our Lord. And whatever we go through, whatever the challenge, the obstacles, we stand with the assurance that you're able and you're willing to work our good, to work it for our good and your glory. We thank you. And we put a praise on it. We refuse to leave here like I came. Come on, come on, put a praise. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, put some praise on that. I'll put some praise. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, God, yeah, yeah. Thank you, God. Hug somebody and encourage them. Now, listen, if you.